Yes. Shane, um, I came on stage till about 7 o'clock at 6.37. Okay. So I talked with the lady who was signing her in, and she said, tell you to probably just put me in a team where I, that might not necessarily need me as much, so I could be earlier or something. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, like, uh, I don't know, like if you want to be in a team with them, uh, <laughs> uh, so he says that he has to leave early. Would I, Are you actually... Peter Mui, I'm a mentor and a judge for the competition. Oh, you ask him to show up. cool. Good to meet you.
Okay, this is just a message for the people who are on webcast. You guys who are in the room can just tune me out. Um, but we will be starting in about five minutes. Okay, so that's for the webcast folks who are on the live stream, and everybody else will start in about five minutes. Thanks. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome very much to uh, the Inventing Green workshop. I am Mimi Kaplan. I'm a graduate student researcher with the Big Ideas Contest. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Big Ideas, it's an early stage social impact focused student led competition. Winning teams receive seed funding of up to $10,000, and we offer mentorship and workshops like this one. The pre-proposal is due on November 14th. And find me or Philip or Francis, who's walking around in a Big Ideas t-shirt, or Danny to learn more about applying. We're delighted that you've joined us. I think that there is more pizza. Feel free to grab some whenever you like and sign in if you haven't already. Um, tonight will be an opportunity to learn from our speaker, Jeremy Faludi, about environmental responsibility and product design and to workshop your own ideas. We're going to start with a quick pre-workshop survey. Um, the first link in the slide behind me. For those of you joining us remotely, we will also drop the link in the chat of the live stream. Um, in general, also for remote questions, feel free to ask via the live stream chat. Tonight's speaker, Jeremy, is a sustainable design strategist and educator. He teaches at Dartmouth College and has taught green design at Stanford, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, uh, the Emily Carr University, and others. He co-wrote the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop, which has been viewed by over a million people worldwide. And he has contributed to seven books on sustainable design. We are excited for him to be here to work with you all tonight. He's also available tomorrow at Blum Hall for a limited number of one-on-one -on -one advising sessions. You can find the link to sign up for them in the email you received from us today and last week. 
with that, please give a warm welcome to Jeremy Faludi. How about that? Am I more audible now? OK, cool. Um, so yeah, so the way this is going to go is um, we, I'm going to start out with a little bit of lecture of uh, priorities for sustainability in invention or design. Um, and then I'm going to show you some online tutorials that I have so that you know, things don't have to end today. You can do a lot of this stuff on your own with some online tools that I put out there. Uh, and then we will actually do together as teams uh, this whole system mapping green design method. So that's why you all have post-it notes and flip charts on your tables here. Uh, and actually, so because we are all sitting in teams, uh, if you are entering the big ideas competition and you're here with your team and you have a product that you're already working on, sit with your team and you can do the workshop on your product design. Uh, so that would be the ideal thing to do. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, then what we're going to do is I'm just going to suggest that everybody do a refrigerator as their uh, you know, dummy product that you're working on. Um, but, uh, but also, if, if you're sitting at a table and uh, you, know, you have some other idea for something else you want to do, feel free to do that. But, uh, but yeah, so if you're, if you're here with your team, uh, definitely work on your product. But, uh, but otherwise, a refrigerator will be a nice gen generic product that everyone can work on. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and then we'll take a break. Although because we're starting late at this point, we'll probably take the break in the middle of the whole system mapping thing because it's, uh, you know, it's more than an hour long, has several steps. Um, and then uh, we'll do a, another smaller workshopping thing on product service systems. And, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So OK, priorities for sustainable invention. So if you could invent anything, where would you do the most good? And I'm not just going to give you a list of stuff here, but instead I'm going to derive this from what the biggest environmental and uh, a little bit of social, but mostly environmental impacts are going on in the world. And so this is going to be a fire hose of information. Uh, don't worry if you don't get a lot of it. Um, I'm throwing out a lot of information because it might be inspiration for startup companies or technologies that you're having. Um, but if, you, if it's too much detail for you, uh, don't worry. I, you know, I have little summaries all along the way. Um, so biggest problems uh, that scientists generally agree the world is facing are uh, climate change, species extinction, resource depletion, pollution, overpopulation, and social injustice. And I'm going to go through priorities for each of these and then wrap it all up at the end. So climate change. Um, this is a chart from World Resources Institute. Yes, I know the text is probably too small for you to read. I'll show you the important parts. Um, basically, it's, it's showing where all the greenhouse gas emissions come from. So CO2 emissions, methane, nitrous oxide, um, and where they start out. Uh, so a lot of it starts out as energy, so burning fossil fuels. Uh, but then some of it is agriculture here and other industrial processes um, and, and some waste. So, um, so things like you've probably heard of uh, cows emitting methane. Uh, that is up here. That's this thing right here. Uh, but actually, twice as big as that uh, in the US, this is US data here, uh, twice as big as that is actually soil outgassing nitrogen. When you till the soil, you, know, you, you crunch it up, uh, that, uh, that off-gasses nitrogen, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, but uh, some of the larger impacts for the US are most of it is due to energy use. And if you see at the top, uh, the top there is transportation. That is not transportation of stuff, it's transportation of people mostly. Because that, that top one is road transportation, that's 21% of all our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then air, so that's you know, all your airplanes. And then the last little slice of that 2.3% is all of 
shipping, all of railroad uh, transport and all that. So most shipping of products is in that little slice there. Now it's still big, you know, if you can cut 1% of US greenhouse gases, awesome. That is a, that is a world changing uh, company there. But, uh, but it's mostly transportation of people that's the bigger impact. Um, and then these two here, residential and commercial buildings, they add up to about 27% of impacts. And uh, a lot of architects argue that some of the other energy use that's ending up in manufacturing is actually for the buildings that the manufacturing is happening in. So some people argue that buildings account for about half of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. Depends on how you count. Uh, but then there's other industries here, like the chemical industry, cement, uh, paper. There's, there's a few other big ones. Um, and worldwide, uh, the energy use is lower and agriculture is significantly larger and then also land use change by which we mean deforestation. So, um, so that's significant on the global scale as well. So if you're looking to fix climate change, some of your top priorities are buildings, remember they were at least 27% in the US if not half, um, and transport of people. And, uh, and then food was a big one. Uh, and then electricity generation, because if you can fix that, you can also fix uh, buildings uh, and some of transport as well. Um, and then chemicals like cement, steel, paper, things like that. But I would also add to this cities on the number one slot, because making dense urban cities fixes both buildings and transportation simultaneously. Um, because you look at the energy use of a large apartment complex, it's way easier to make that energy efficient than a single family home. Um, in fact, it takes a lot of design, uh, a lot of engineering to make a single family home anywhere near as efficient as just an ordinary dumpy uh, apartment complex. Uh, and then same thing with transportation. If you're living in a dense urban environment, you can walk places, you can bicycle, you can take public transit, things that just don't work if you're more spread out. Um, and so some good examples of what uh, people are doing. So density doesn't have to mean 50-story skyscrapers. It can mean five-story row houses. Uh, that's still a nice, uh, gentle way of life that doesn't scare too many people. Um, uh, this is Calera Concrete, it's a, actually a California startup where their, uh, their concrete production sequesters CO2 rather than emitting it. Or this one here is actually a Berkeley company called All Power Labs. They're making, uh, in theory, a carbon negative fuel, um, which is exciting. And then electric cars, everybody loves electric cars, but what's actually better transportation wise is working from your living room, you know, telecommuting. And this is, this is a good point for business startups. If you want to fix transportation, you don't have to work in transportation. You don't have to build vehicles. You can build telecommuting interfaces. If you want to fix buildings, you don't need to be an architect. You can make better building software. This is a screenshot uh, from software that does building energy modeling and daylight modeling. Um, and actually, this, air, this whole industry needs a lot of innovation and work. Um, or if you want to fix the paper industry, you don't need to make better paper, you can make interfaces that make paper obsolete. Um, and so when you're thinking of new businesses to be in, remember you, you can go laterally. You don't have to attack that problem head on. Okay, and then species extinction. This is a chart from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment where the rows are different kinds of ecosystems, forests, drylands, marine, etc. Uh, and the different columns are risks that are, or things that are causing impact. So habitat change, climate change, invasive species, overexploitation, and pollution. And the, uh, the darker the colors here, the more damage they're causing. So, so this column here has the most red boxes. It's the one causing the most damage. Uh, and so that's habitat change. So what does that mean? That means land that is being converted from wild lands to farmland or ranch land, things like that. Um, a little bit of, of it is urban sprawl, but only about 3%. Uh, most of it is agriculture. Um, and then the one with the second most boxes that are red is pollution. 
And this is mostly nitrogen and phosphorus, which is from fertilizers from agriculture. And then the next one, overexploitation, that's you know, overfishing, overharvesting. Again, that is for the food system. Um, and invasive species, guess what causes most invasive species? Agriculture, bringing in new plants and animals to a place. So, um, uh, so this one, climate change, this is pretty much the only one that is not primarily caused by agriculture. Um, and so if you want to fix species extinction, uh, your main priority is fixing food systems. Um, and there's particularly things that are land efficient and that um, are organic or don't use pesticides and, and fertilizers. Um, and then also fixing pollution, we'll talk more about that a little later. And resource depletion, we'll talk more about that. Um, and climate change, we already talked about. So some good things that people are doing or places that need innovation, uh, actually hydroponics is an amazing technology. It's the most land efficient form of agriculture on the planet. Uh, you can grow lettuce, you can grow about 17 times as much lettuce per acre of land or hectare of land um, um, in a, in a um, aquaponics or hydroponic system as you can out uh, in the world. And you can do it organically. It's a closed environment, so you don't need the uh, pesticides that you would out in the world. And you can recycle 100% of your water in the same loop. You can even have fish living in there. That's aquaponics as opposed to hydroponics. Uh, so that now you're also reducing overfishing because you, know, you can sell the fish as well. Um, and you can, uh, people are starting to experiment with entire uh, sort of skyscraper level vertical farms uh, in, in cities. It's still mostly a theory concept, but this is a space that could use a lot more innovation. And just low tech urban gardening uh, is a big growth area as well. And actually the UN estimates that we could reduce um, the needs for farmland by a third, even as world population grows by two thirds, just by having more urban agriculture. Um, okay, and then resource depletion. So water is a big one here in California, something that a lot of people don't know. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to do a water efficiency project by having people take shorter showers. That is a waste of your time. Um, because all of the water use that you see, all of your showers and toilets and faucets, all of that is about 8% of your water use. Yeah? Well, uh, stay with me here, and, and I'll, I'll finish this thought, and, and hopefully that'll answer your, your question there. Um, so, so the water that's embodied in the products that you use, you know, the chairs that you're sitting in and the laptops or phones in front of you, that's about 22% of your water use. And 70% of your water use is in the food that you eat. And irrigation is really inefficient, so half of that is wasted. So um, there is more water used in irrigation that never even gets to the crops that just evaporates into the air than all of your personal and industrial water use combined. And so if places like Austin uh, could redirect more water from agriculture nearby, uh, then the city would have plenty of water. Um, and if the, if the farms could use more efficient use of water. Because like here in California, California uh, you know, has had a lot of trouble with drought as well. Um, but if you look at the numbers, I, actually I forget what the exact numbers are, but like all of the municipal water use in California is a fraction of what uh, agriculture uses. Um, and, and that's where, this is where all the biggest gains can be made. Although, although the other thing is a lot of min municipal water use uh, is in lawns and things like that, which is also a form of irrigation. But yeah. Um, and in terms of where that water goes in different foods, 
um, different foods are more efficient than others. So a kilo of beef requires about 15,000 liters of water to raise. So here in California, uh, one of the biggest water users is the alfalfa farming industry, which, and it's not like people are eating that alfalfa. That alfalfa is going to livestock, so it's turning into beef. Um, and so that's about five times the water use per kilo as chicken, about 10 times as wheat. Um, and so that's, a, so that's an important thing for water use. Now what about for material use? So this is a chart over the last 100 years of uh, US uh, material use. The green here is wood and cotton and other agricultural or forest products. Uh, the yellow here is non-renewable organics, that's plastics basically. Uh, the pink is metals and that's mostly steel and aluminum. Uh, and then the purple is actually recycled metal, so nice that that is growing. Um, the blue is industrial minerals, a lot of potash, phosphate, sulfur, things like that. And then the top here, three quarters of your material use is crushed stone, sand, and gravel. What do you think you're using all that crushed stone, sand, and gravel for? Building. What's that? Building? Yeah, exactly. This stuff here, concrete. Um, yeah, in buildings and roads. So, so yeah, the two biggest sources, biggest uses of that are, are roads and buildings. Um, and then for, for these other minerals, um, like uh, potash and phosphates, those are getting used in agriculture, but a lot of this is uh, the cement part of, so it's, yeah, it's the cement part of concrete. Um, and so that's going into buildings and roads as well, uh, and the chemical industry. Uh, metals are mostly being used for uh, also buildings, you know, a lot of aluminum and structural steel around here, and cars and appliances. Um, and then wood also largely used in buildings, and then paper, and then a little bit for fuel as well. Uh, but it's not just sheer mass of materials. Some materials are much rarer than others. Um, so this is a, a sort of fun chart. It's, this is actually many years old by now, so don't worry about the numbers. But, um, but uh, there are a lot of rare minerals that get used, particularly in electronics. Uh, so, so for example, we probably have somewhere between 30 and 40 years worth of gold left in the Earth's crust before we're just out. Um, now, mining techniques do get better every year, like um, this, uh, this chart was made about 10 years ago and it shows about four years worth of indium left in the world. Indium is used in LCD screens uh, and other electronics. Now LCD screens still exist, so uh, it's a combination of people mining better and also using less of it in their products. Um, and the good side of this is that there are some metals and other minerals that are already getting recycled uh, at high rates. So almost three quarters of the lead in the economy is already recycled lead. Um, and about half of the aluminum and about 40% of the gold in the economy is already recycled. But we need to get that to 100% because really the only sustainable mining is mining landfills or mining things that are already in the economy. So, okay, to sum up all of those resource depletion things, uh, once again, buildings and transport of people uh, food, particularly uh, beef, is, is really an outlier uh, compared to even other meats, much less other foods. Um, and then uh, chemical industry, paper, and electronics is, is really big for the rare minerals. And once again, cities help here because it makes both buildings and transportation more material efficient. You know, again, if you're building an apartment complex or an office building, most of those walls are shared by both sides. So that's half the amount of material for the same number of people. Um, and for transportation, it's more material efficient because you don't need as many roads. You have more people using the same roads. And you need fewer vehicles, you need fewer cars, so you need less steel uh, in all of those things. Um, yeah, so that's why cities help. And there are lots of fun things that people are doing in the world. Uh, up here is this product called Kirei Board out of Japan. It's agricultural waste that has been 
pressed together, um, not even using any toxic glues, but just uh, pressed together into this really beautiful plywood. Like it, it has a really nice aesthetic to it. Um, or Method, the soap company. Uh, you know, you can go into Target or whatever, any stores, and get some of this. Uh, they use 100% recycled plastic for most of their packaging. Uh, this one down here, this is a pile of e-waste. So this Canadian gold mining company called Noranda, actually they changed their name, but I forget what their new name. Anyway, um, about 20 years ago, they discovered that uh, there was 17 times more gold in a, a kilo of e-waste than there was in a kilo of ore that they were digging out of the ground in their mines. And so they have become one of the world's biggest e-waste recyclers because it's a mining operation for them. Uh, and this is actually a local Bay Area startup, Impossible Foods. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah, I see some heads nodding. So yeah, so they make fake meat. Uh, and they apparently do it better than anyone else has done before. Uh, and it's all vegetable uh, product, so it's much lower environmental impact per kilo of quote unquote beef that you're eating. OK. Um, and for pollution, so this guy here is you know, fishing in a river full of trash. But actually, the trash is not the biggest problem with pollution in rivers. Uh, water pollution is mostly agricultural uh, fertilizer and pesticides. And then sewage treatment plants, industrial discharges, uh, various other stuff. And, and you know, this isn't in like kilos of material. This is in uh, numbers of, of fish killed by different pollutants. And for air pollution, um, you can see at the top here of uh, fuel combustion of electric utilities. So a lot of that is coal power plants. Some of it is gas, but this is mostly coal. You can tell because a lot of it is the yellow sulfur dioxide. Um, and then uh, highway vehicles and off-highway vehicles is the fourth one down, so that's more fossil fuel burning. And there's fuel combustion down here as well. Um, and then, so, so a lot of it is, is energy use fossil fuels for uh, transportation and buildings and industry. Um, and then one thing that's new here is the solvent utilization. So uh, that's in chemical industry and also paints and um, cleaning chemicals, things like that. And then for solid waste, uh, sort of similar to water, uh, your solid waste is not what you think it is. So all of the waste that you see, everything that you throw in the trash, uh, you know, all the packaging and all that stuff, old sweaters, whatever, that is all this little green slice in municipal. Um, but uh, this is the construction industry. So, you know, recycling paper is good. Recycling buildings is even more important. Um, and then industrial, so that's in manufacturing waste. So, you know, if you're manufacturing product, eliminating waste there is as important, even more important than, you know, you recycling at home. And then the coal industry by itself produces almost as much solid waste as cities do. Um, so that by itself is a big impact. And then quote unquote special wastes, uh, that is the mining industry. And so that's mostly mining of, of minerals and, and metals and fossil fuels as well. So oil and gas. And so that kind of goes into all of these. So it's a little hard to separate. Uh, and then toxins are this whole other complicated thing that I'm really not going to get into. But if you look at some of the um, uh, most frequently uh, found toxins that, that show up in people's bodies causing them health problems, uh, things like alkyl phenols, cadmium, lead, methylmercury, uh, they tend to show up, they tend to get into your body through uh, the top one, cosmetics and detergents, pesticides, paints, uh, carpet and dry cleaning, um, pressure treated wood, so that's in buildings, carpet obviously also in buildings, um, uh, contaminated food and drinking water, uh, factory air, so that's 
buildings again, um, uh, dietary sources, so again, food, lead-based paint in homes, so again, buildings, uh, and uh, vinyl products, uh, dietary, uh, food, food, et cetera, et cetera. So if you sort of combine all of these things together, once again, uh, food is a really big one. It's a big uh, exposure source and causes a lot of the um, you know, water pollution, et cetera. Uh, and then buildings, transport of people again, electricity generation again, uh, and then the chemical industry shows up more here than it did before with solvents and paints and things. Um, and uh, yeah, and plastics and electronics. And there's plenty of cool stuff going on here too. So uh, up in this corner, this is a circuit board where the back plane is not made out of fiberglass, which is what normal circuit boards are made out of. Instead, uh, it's made of a composite of ground up chicken feathers and soy plastic. Um, or over here, this is a circuit board where the, the traces, the, the conductive leads, are not made out of copper, they're made out of conductive carbon ink that is inkjet printed onto the circuit board with no waste. Or um, this is a product called Zelfo. It's basically a paper mache, but it's as strong as plastic, you know, like you would have for any chair here, so you can make furniture with it. And here, this is milk-based paint. So it's a paint where instead of uh, you know, an, uh, phenolic solvent, it's using milk as the actual solvent. Um, and so this has been a lot of stuff. Are there other questions so far? No? OK. So then overpopulation. Uh, this, is, this is a big one just because the more people there are, the more resources we use. Um, and so a lot of people think that uh, birth control is the answer to this. It's not as much of an answer as you think, actually. So the blue line here is the availability of birth control. This was a study done uh, in India a few years ago. Uh, even when you quadruple the availability of birth control, actual birth rates yeah, they may only fall like 15, 20% or so. What makes a much bigger difference is cities. So this is a bunch of, of um, uh, countries around Africa where the orange bars are birth rates in rural areas. The gray bars are urban areas that are not slums, you know, where people have a decent income and jobs and stuff and the light orange is urban slums. So it's kind of halfway between. And um, so people that are in cities and have decent jobs often have around half the birth rate of people out in the countryside. So they're both having fewer kids and having kids later in life than if they're out on the farm. And, uh, and educating women and empowering women also makes an enormous difference. So these are uh, education rates across several different countries all around the world. Um, and just from having no education to just a high school education, you can see sometimes the birth rates are cut in half, sometimes by two thirds. So that is a huge impact. Um, and so if you want to fix overpopulation, top priority, empowering women, through education, economic self-determination, and uh, political uh, equality. And then cities are, again, a big important thing. And then access to birth control family planning is still important. It's just uh, not as, it doesn't solve the problem by itself as much as the others do. Um, and then finally, social injustice. And this actually could be a whole nother half hour long thing, uh, but I'm, I'm just going to gloss over it very quickly because it's less quantitative than the other stuff. Uh, and I'm an engineer, so I have a bias. Um, and so it's just harder to attach numbers to these things and, and set priorities. But, uh, but basically, the people who study this have argued that these are the main um, barriers to social justice in the world. Uh, wealth creation. And so uh, having a job, having an income, but also having access to credit, having material goods like land you can own, a house you can own. Um, so wealth and income are not 
always the same thing. Um, and then political influence, you know, can you vote, does your vote count? Um, health, education, and culture, or how we, how we make meaning in the world. And um, uh, so, so like I said, it's hard to do quantitative priorities here, but these are listed in rough order of priority. And most people at least generally agree that if you provide people more wealth, they can get health care and get education and preserve their culture. If you give people political influence, they can get health care, they can get education, you know, they can get uh, cultural relevance. Um, but, uh, but it's less, less obviously ordered than the other ones. Um, and there are lots of good things going on here, lots of social enterprises. In fact, uh, there are more solar installers today. There are more people employed as solar installers today than are employed by the entire coal industry and natural gas industry put together. Uh, and uh, uh, home retrofits for energy efficiency. This is a great way to fix buildings uh, in terms of their energy use and material use. Uh, and it can also be a great way to provide jobs to people where you're ramping up from low skill to high skill. Um, up here, uh, Goodwill, they have been doing job training for people for decades now. That's actually their main mission. And uh, you can even get into politics. This is um, a group called, uh, what are they, uh, Civic Data Alliance. Uh, and they, they do data. This is like voting uh, rates in certain uh, neighborhoods of a city. And so there are lots of things that you can do. So just wrapping up here, again, if you can invent anything, where would you do the most good? And I would say combining all of these different sets of priorities from all these different specific things that we've looked at, I'd probably say cities, buildings, food, transport, electricity generation, empowering women, jobs, or wealth creation. Again, not always the same thing. Um, political access, uh, you know, can you vote, does your vote count? Uh, and, and then other industries like chemicals, paper. And, and you know, don't worry about which thing on this list or e the exact order of, you know, what's number two and what's number five. That doesn't matter that much. You know, if you're attacking anything on this list, that is a huge problem and you can make giant impacts in the world. Um, and yeah, and each of these is full of new solutions just waiting to be born. Okay, so that was it for the priorities. I know that was a bit of a fire hose, but uh, are there, are there any other questions that people have? OK. So then I wanted to show you some of the resources that I've got available. So there's this, there's this website. Uh, I don't know, are, are all of you familiar with VentureWell? No? OK. So they are a nonprofit that encourages entrepreneurship in engineering students. And so they sponsor entrepreneurship contests uh, like Big Ideas, but actually um, they, they have their own competition. They have e-teams, and you can get grants from them. Uh, there are you know, companies that have been started that way, green tech companies that have been started that way. Um, and so they, on their website here, uh, just just six months ago, actually, so they, they paid me to put a bunch of my green design class online, and so it's now free for anybody to use. And so um, if, you, if you go to VentureWell.org, and it's just tools for design, or also if you just go to the VentureWell homepage and uh, go to ideas and impact and tools for design and sustainability, and it's just there in the menu. Um, and so it has a lot of stuff. So it's got this little intro thing, uh, just telling you all the different areas from measuring sustainability to materials to uh, energy effectiveness, uh, changing lifestyles, so like behavioral design. Um, and each one of those things has stuff on the sidebar here. And so you can go through and like if you want to look at green materials, um, there are a bunch of videos on that. So, 
like here's an example of, I'll just do a, like 30 seconds of one of the videos. When looking for sustainable materials, the first step is to know where their ecological impacts come from. Here are some guidelines. Abundant materials are usually more sustainable than scarce materials. To make a profit in the 1920s, a copper mine had to get a kilo of copper out of every four kilos of ore. This meant small mines with high ore grades. But now, mines can afford to dig up 100 kilos of ore to get that same kilo of copper. The other 99 kilos becomes waste. So today, because copper has become scarcer, mines are much larger and produce more waste than they used to. Even certain renewable resources are becoming scarce. Some trees, like Caribbean mahogany, are being harvested too quickly and becoming endangered. When using wood, try to find sources that are certified as sustainably harvested. Materials like bamboo are called rapidly renewable because they can be regrown and harvested fast enough to keep up with heavy demand. This often makes them a good choice. You also need to look at the energy and resources that go into gathering a material. So yeah, so you get the idea. And there's, uh, there's about two dozen of these videos on different topics. And you can also find things like these uh, material chooser charts. So if you're looking for a, uh, a metal in, in your project, you can, you can look at this chart of what things are better. You know, scrap metal is pretty much always going to be the best. Uh, and recycled, and then steel, uh, and then down to things like gold, silver, cadmium, etc. cetera. Um, and it also has things of like why you might select it, if you're going for strength, or hardness, or moisture resistance, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, so there are a lot of resources like that on here. Um, and um, yeah, from, and we'll, we'll, we'll use this a little bit um, in here as well. Any questions on this? No? Okay, cool. Um, so, so yeah, so the next thing we're going to do, we're going to dive into our workshop part, and we're actually going to use this whole system mapping design method, which you can find on the website. And it will start out by showing you a little video on how that works, and then we will get into actually doing it. We're going to start by looking at the two most important global principles of sustainable design, whole systems and life cycle thinking. Here's the challenge. Assume you're designing, say, a clothes dryer. You want to make one that's more sustainable without driving costs way up or performance way down. How would you do it? Well, you could let your imagination just run wild and jump in anywhere. But how would you know when you have a good answer before you even know what problem you're really trying to solve? Which approaches should you go with? And how will you make the tough decisions when two strategies conflict? Before you start jumping to conclusions and fixating on any final design solutions, the first step is to more deeply define the problem by looking at the whole system. So let's expand our thinking from the dryer to the larger process of clothes getting dirty, being washed, and being dried. It looks something like this. Now look at the system even more broadly. A marketing person might be able to tell you about how customers actually use their dryers. A manufacturing expert might point out obvious production limitations you'll need to work around. Getting other perspectives early on is always helpful. These kinds of insights help you understand and bound the problem. Now that you see the system, it's time to zero in on how you want to improve it by identifying the biggest impacts and minimizing them. To optimize for environmental performance, you need to consider impacts through the entire life cycle of your product or service. We'll keep our example simple by looking at only the hardware in the system. The washer and dryer impact the environment through their manufacturing, distribution, use, and disposal. At each one of these stages, there may be greenhouse gas emissions, water pollution, air pollution, toxins, or other environmental impacts. Your analysis should measure these impacts to the best of your ability. The most thorough way to do this is called life cycle assessment. You may want to compare your results against some benchmark. 
In our case, you'll find that reducing the energy use during the life of the dryer offers the most opportunity for improvement, more than raw material use, waste, or any other factors. The important thing at this stage is to realize where the environmental impacts are coming from and quantify them in some way so you know your priorities and can set metrics around them. That way, you can make the case for your environmental goals and fit them in with other project requirements. Okay, using systems and life cycle thinking, we've narrowed down our challenge from build a more sustainable clothes dryer to use less energy to dry clothes. Now that we've defined the problem, how do we solve it? You might jump in to the obvious solution of making the dryer's heating system more efficient. But you're likely to find that heating systems are already quite efficient, and the incremental gains you can make by re-engineering them dry up pretty quickly. Instead of making small improvements to one part of the clothes drying process, let's look for solutions by looking again at the whole system. Notice that the washing machine supplies the wet clothes to the dryer. The wetter the clothes are, the more energy they take to dry, right? Now we can ask new questions like, might we save energy by delivering the clothes to the dryer in a less wet condition? Well, a washing machine already shares in the drying process by spinning the clothes to a damp state with centrifugal force. And here's a chance to innovate. A washing machine with a more effective spin cycle might use slightly more energy, but lets the dryer save a ton more. It turns out that the solution for a more sustainable dryer is a slightly more energy-intensive washing machine. This is just one strategy. By brainstorming, you might come up with a whole slew of other ones. Approaching the problem with a blank slate can help lead you to more drastic innovations, like eliminating the dryer altogether from the system in favor of a next-generation clothesline. Or creating fabrics that need to be cleaned less often. Your broad thinking at the beginning makes seeing these solutions possible. As you start thinking of potential solutions in the context of the whole system, you'll begin to see the relationships between them, and one idea is likely to lead to the next. This is the kind of thinking that's leading to the biggest gains in sustainability everywhere. For tips to guide your brainstorming and help with this design process, look to folks like Amory Lovins and the Rocky Mountain Institute for inspiration. They've developed a whole set of useful principles for radical resource efficiency called the Factor 10 Engineering Principles. Once you've got a lot of solutions, how do you choose between them? Well, you should go back to the goals you set when thinking about the life cycle impacts of the design and assess each option. Some of these options will obviously be better than others, so you can throw a bunch away quickly. But what about the best few choices that are left? When you compare all your possible strategies against the same criteria of cost, performance, environmental and social impact, you can make an intelligent decision about what the best solutions are. Once you've chosen a solution to develop, you'll begin solving all kinds of technical engineering problems. Autodesk tools like Inventor and Al Gore can help you do simulations and analysis to optimize your design throughout the process. For example, spinning the washer faster may require a different material or may create the need for vibration suppression, which brings up new costs and impacts. This time we focused on energy use because that was by far the biggest impact of the dryer. But you may want to repeat this again and focus on the next highest design priority, which in your case might be materials or durability. We covered that pretty fast, and no design process is ever this linear. But every time you run through this process, you're going to innovate. It opens your eyes to the bigger picture and helps you attack the most important problem. Then it breaks you out of your normal boxes to find super creative new ideas and helps make sure you pick the best ones to improve the sustainability of your product. This is how you get the most far-reaching innovation, helping you design products that are better for their users and for the world. Okay, and so we are going to do exactly that. Um, and again, if you want to do this at home later or you know, with your teams, once you've formed a team, uh, all the steps are in the exercise portion of the, of the website here. But uh, just for the sake of readability, I'm, I'm not going to go off of this. I'm going to go off of a, uh, a different set that I already have. Um, so yeah, so like I said, if you are not with your team and you don't already have a product idea, go for a refrigerator, um, unless, unless you want to have some other random product. But, uh, but yeah, we can start out with a refrigerator. And so the first step is 
defining the system. So we're going to actually use the post-it notes on your, on your table and uh, open up the post-it notes and divide them up so that everybody gets some post-it notes. We don't want one person hogging all the post-its and other people sitting there bored. Uh, so share the post-it notes. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. I didn't know Dylan had done all those videos. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you know. <laughs> you guys all have done the survey? Awesome. So. It's not like, like quite like, oh, we need to create better landscaping or cities. Like this is like a, like a fidgeting toy kind of. Okay. And so like, for our problem, we wanted to talk about how current methods are not super accessible or sustainable. You mean manufacturing methods? Yeah, but okay. I mean, like also for, like let's say, you, you probably have heard of like the fidget cube. Right? Mm, it's kind I don't of looks know. like this, it has six sides of fidgeting. Oh, I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, the materials inside are not sustainable, they're not, sure. you can't really yeah. recycle them, and right. it's not also accessible because you have to carry it around everywhere, so we're trying to develop uh, a product that you can, can stick to surfaces that you use all the time, whether it's the back of your phone, or your laptop, or your desk, and okay. then you have customized electives with the 
the housing of these activities we want to make it sustainable so we can keep it uh, it's cheap but also um, we can recycle it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would I would recommend coming into one of my office hours slots tomorrow. Okay, great. So yeah, I think that would be the best. Oh, are you are you going to use that for your yeah. system map? I mean, that's it's our great. project. Uh, great, perfect. Um, well, we will we will step you through it. Okay, but like when I'm saying like defining the problem, like what should I say? Uh, so, we, I mean, I'll, I'll take you through it, but, you know, you'll do your bill of materials and how it's used, what it's used with, all that. So we're good? Okay, cool. I'm not sure how you yet. So you're giving more direction on this one, right? Um, well, I was just answering a question, but I was just waiting for them to finish the surveys. Okay, perfect. So, but I think we're done now. Okay, great. Yeah, I think they're good. Yeah. Okay, everyone's done with the survey? Yeah? Cool. All right. So... First step of the whole system mapping, um, define the problem and its whole system. So for a, whoops, where do we go here? Okay. If we take another five minutes, we should try and like see what we're doing. Or two minutes. Oh, oh. Okay, let's not have time, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start everyone else, and if you need to start a little slower, you can, you can do that, yeah. So, so if you're doing a fridge, you know, you start out, the refrigerator is, is the problem that you're working on. And uh, so what are the things that you need in the system map? Well, you need the bill of materials. What's a fridge made out of? Uh, and this is just a sketch, you know, don't use this, make your own. Um, and, and you could do an exploded diagram as well. That's actually better than this. But, you know, what is a fridge made out of? It's made out of uh, a, a place to hold cold stuff and usually a freezer up on top. It's got a door. It's made, got insulation. It's got a metal skin. Uh, it's got cooling coils on the inside with a compressor that uh, pumps the working fluid to the heat exchanger on the outside that radiates the heat away. It's got a little valve that's part of the, uh, the heat pump system. And um, yeah, and so one of the key things that you need in your system app is your bill of materials. What are all the major components or major sub-assemblies? So that needs to be in your system map. Um, could be in the center. Um, next thing that you need is the life cycle. So mining the raw material, doing the manufacturing, transporting it somewhere, and what happens at the end of its life? Does it get landfilled? So that's the second thing that you need in your system map. Um, and then the next thing that you need in your system map is the user interaction. What does the user do with the refrigerator? They open it up at two o'clock in the morning and stare longingly inside to see if there's new food there that was not there earlier today. Um, or, you know, they open up, you put food in, you take food out. That's pretty much the user interaction. You, you search for food. That's part of the user interaction, okay? Um, and, um, and then what is the product used with? So, uh, you know, a refrigerator, obviously used with food. If you're designing a car, that's used with roads. Um, if you're uh, designing, I don't know, uh, a, a table, you, you know, it would probably be used with chairs or other things, et cetera, et cetera. So you're trying to see the bigger picture here. Uh, so go ahead and start doing your system map and just make sure that it has all these different elements in it. Uh, but don't just copy this one. You know, make, it, make up your own. Are you folks working on your own project? Yeah, yes. cool. Sort of an organization. So we're building um, hopefully compostable latrines in the ground. Okay, cool. And so what are uh, so it looks like you've already gotten a start this is here. This like usage cycle. Yeah. Okay. Just kind of like although there'd be like more with like because like their industry 
or like their main economic entity is their agriculture. Okay. So we have, we have to put that into there, but this is like half the cycle. Cool. And do you have the uh, all the different physical parts of the system, the bill of materials, and the all right, all right, cool. How are you folks doing back here? Good. I see a blank slate. Okay. Yeah. Are you are you doing the refrigerator? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And the goal, the job of the refrigerator is to keep food from spoiling. Mm -hmm. The bigger so yeah, it's like how big to go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hi. What's up? Yeah. So um, uh, this original this is like the kind of. Um, that I still kind of stop working, but it's just like a creating like a thermal cup to replace disposable cups. Uh huh. So the idea is kind of like if you can create thermal cups that you can put in stores, and then people can go to the store, rent the cup, go around the city, and then you can have collection bins. You put on the bin, the company comes and collects, then washes it, and you go back into the shop. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of But the only thing I'm, I'm not quite sure is like, is it environmentally worthwhile? Because just need paper cups are. Are really cheap, and right. the thing is, um, and to collect them, you need to have more sophistication to keep them around. So I'm not sure, like, is it environmentally good to have this? Ah, uh, so that is actually a question for our next activity, which is uh, life cycle assessment. We're not going to do that for real in this workshop because of time limitations, okay, okay. but um, but you can answer those questions quantitatively using life cycle assessment. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But so and so, is this what you're gonna do for the for the design method here? Yeah. Great. Go for it. So yeah. So what's the bill of materials here? Let's start with that. Get some post-it notes down for that, um, and then the you know the life cycle and the user interaction and, and all that. How are you folks doing here? Yeah. How are you doing here? Oh, we're good. Cool. Yeah, we are phone an idea. Okay. Uh, are, you, are you doing the refrigerator or are you doing your own idea? Okay. What is it? Like home ones, like, you know. Like, What's that? Oh, like, yeah, yeah home. Yeah, it's, it's replacing the metals, I mean, concrete, with composites. So oh, rebar. Yeah, the one for framework, yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Cool. So fiber reinforced concrete? Exactly. Okay. Cool. And so let's let's start getting down the bill of materials there and the usage. What you got? So I'll let you say it. It's your project. So we feel like this is already kind of narrow. Like the problem we're addressing is plastic waste in Uganda. And so like mm. this bridge is a solution to the problem of like storing food. Yes. Whereas so like we have some ideas of products that we can make from plastic waste, so we could choose like plastic roofing tiles and like build a whole system map around plastic roofing tiles. Yeah. But we feel like the or we could build a system map around the plastic waste. So where do we, do we build it around the problem or do we build it around the solution? Yeah, and you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, this is usually designed for um, more targeted problems, um, but uh, you, could, you could try doing it off of just the plastic waste system. I would be curious to see what comes out of that. I mean, it depends on how you, how you feel. Are you comfortable with uh, ambiguity and uh, uncertainty? Uh, if so, then I would do the plastic waste problem. Uh, if you are not comfortable with that, so then... One of my recommendations was, if you're going to build that whole system map and then come back to your solution, then you might as well have started with the solution. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. That's one suggestion. A yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, one of the one of the goals of this as a design method is to sort of bust you out of the sort of status quo solutions that you would do and look at the bigger system. So maybe if you just start with roof tiles, you would automatically bust out into the bigger system anyway. Um, but if you want to start with that bigger system, that's that's fine too. Yeah, yeah. Well, give it a try. See how it goes. 
<laughs> How are you folks doing here? <laughs> uh, you're doing you're doing the uh, the anti post-it note, huh?
Okay, so hopefully you have a good system map with um, with all of these things in it. And then the next step, which uh, some people have already asked me about, which is great, uh, is now what do you do with your priorities for redesign? Uh, like I said in the video, you try to quantify what your environmental impacts are. And uh, first of all, you want to sort of set your boundaries, decide what you're going to consider and not consider. So you might decide, I am a refrigerator manufacturer. I can't deal with the food system. I'm not going to change farming. I'm not going to change uh, you know, municipal waste disposal. I'm just going to do refrigerators. Um, and so you can sort of draw a line about what you are going to consider and what you aren't going to consider. Um, and then you can So um, this is for a, a fridge, and actually I have a more general one, so for those of you that are doing different kinds of projects. So large electrical devices, this is a, this is some vague categories here, uh, but large electrical devices that last many years, their environmental impacts will usually be primarily the energy use while you're using them. Uh, and then the materials and manufacturing so it does take energy, and it does take minerals, and it does take other stuff to make the fridge. Um, but usually the impacts of that is pretty small compared to the energy use. And the, the transport of getting the fridge from the factory to the store and then to your home is also, it's usually vanishingly small. It's usually a couple percent of the lifetime impacts. Um, and then same with the end of life. If the whole thing just gets thrown in a landfill, uh, none of it recycled, that's usually pretty small compared to the energy use. Um, now, then if it's small electronics, like uh, you know, like a phone or a Fitbit or something like that, the calculus is different. It's mostly about the materials that are that it, the product is made out of, and particularly the electronics part. So with with like a cell phone. And people have made cell phones with a fancy bamboo case, and like, oh, it's an eco cell phone. <laughs> yeah. um, that is what we call greenwashing. Um, and and to be fair, actually, most greenwashing, I think, is unintentional. You know, people aren't trying to be evil. They're just trying to say, well. actually make a difference, um, you know, because that's hitting the, uh, the, the light blue part of the bar there. Um, and then again, transport, uh, it's pretty small. Uh, it can be higher because shipping by, by air uh, has about 20 times the environmental impact per uh, kilometer as shipping by, uh, by rail or, you know, or by boat. So, uh, and a lot of these things do get shipped by air rather than by boat. So, so you know, that's a little higher. And then energy a lot, you know, like shirts and uh, uh, pants and things like that. Uh, surprisingly, it's not all about the material uh, and the manufacturing. A lot of it is also the energy use as well, um, at least in countries like the U.S. where it's standard for people to use both washers and dryers rather than, you know, hanging things out to dry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but then here it's less clear what your priorities are. You know, so you could attack the think, how can we make clothing that doesn't need to be washed as much, or that doesn't need to go in a dryer because it doesn't wrinkle? Yeah? Uh, do you think this is uh, That's a good question. And so these are vague, made-up units. So, but, uh, so, so life cycle assessment is a really flexible way of measuring things. So uh, you can just measure carbon emissions if you want. So a carbon footprint is a life cycle assessment that is only measuring carbon. And 
and uh, but but that el but that also brings up the point that this doesn't consider any social impacts, um, and so you could use other scorecards besides LCA. You could use like cradle cradle certification has a whole checklist of stuff where they include social things as well as environmental things. Or if you're doing electronics, EPS certification, they have a whole scorecard of stuff as well. And as long as it's quantifiable and it can give you priorities here, that's that's the important thing. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, so then, just like in the video, you want to set out what your priorities are. so that you can look at it for your different product categories. If you're doing the fridge, your top priority is reducing energy use during the life of the fridge. But if your product is one of these other things, you'll have different priorities. Um, oh yeah, I didn't get to furniture uh, and just sort of general housewares. It's usually mostly about the materials and you know, like tables don't use electricity, so most of them. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so go ahead and write down somewhere on your system map what your priorities are. And I would, you know, have them in a clear ranked order what number one, number two, and number three are, and balance both the environmental and business priorities. So then take a few minutes on that.
Okay, so hopefully you got some good priorities here. Um, and then once you, once you have your priorities, these priorities become the brainstorm topic. So, you know, your brainstorm is where the fun ideas happen, uh, but you need a goal for the brainstorm. And so your brainstorm's goal is to achieve these priorities. So if you're uh, doing the fridge here, your, uh, your priorities for brainstorming are, oh, Okay, um, thanks. So your priorities for brainstorming will be um, how can we come up with tons of new ideas that reduce total energy use without sacrificing user convenience or price? And the, the thing that makes brainstorming on your system map different from a normal brainstorm is basically two things. Or well, well so first of all, Normal brainstorming is actually a structured activity. It's not just sitting around having ideas. Um, so you want to defer judgment. There are no bad ideas. In fact, wild, crazy, ridiculous ideas are encouraged. Just have more ideas. If you think an idea is stupid, just have another idea that makes it better. Or that is equally stupid and more crazy. Um, because that's how you get creativity. Um, and yeah, go for volume, have lots of ideas. Um, one conversation at a time so everyone knows what you're talking about. Be visual, you can sketch stuff even if it's terrible sketch, that's okay. Um, you know, headline, you know, summarize, don't write paragraphs. Um, build on the ideas of others, stay on topic, uh, and like I said, encourage wild, crazy ideas. So that's true for any brainstorm. But then particularly brainstorming on your system map, it helps you in two ways. Number one, it helps you avoid fixating on one little part of the problem, but broadens you out to look at everything in the system. So, so here you can see we've got a couple ideas for, uh, for the structure of the drawers, we've got a couple ideas for insulation, um, but we don't have any ideas for different materials or different manufacturing. So that means you need to keep having more ideas. So uh, now we've got some ideas for uh, manufacturing. We don't have any ideas for energy, so you need to keep having more ideas. So now you've got some, a whole bunch of ideas for energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And just make sure that you have at least one idea, hopefully two or three ideas, for everything on your system map so that you think more broadly. Um, and did you have a question? Yeah. Oh yeah, so I left out the food production, all the farming and all that. Because I figured you're a refrigerator company, so you're not gonna change farming. Yeah. But you could have ideas on that if you want. Yeah. Um, so, that's, so that's one thing, uh, is use of the system map to broaden where you have ideas. And the second thing is eliminating components of the system. Because this is how you can have more radical, sort of crazy game-changing ideas. Uh, you know, can you eliminate parts of the system, like, like actually in this previous one, instead of going to landfill, you can reuse components or recycle material, but even more wild and crazy, uh, looking at different ways to preserve food. You can salt food, you can pickle food, you can dry food, and those eliminate all kinds of steps in the system. And so it shows you that it's a more radical solution. So, um, so go through your, yeah, so go through your system map and brainstorm. Have lots of ideas and again, have at least one or two ideas for everything in your system and have ideas that eliminate components or steps in the system. Okay, go.
Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah, we'd love to. Uh, so, you know, on your own, you can keep doing this. But like, this is this is part of the innovation. This is part of why this is a design method to cause innovation, not just sustainability, is to get you to rethink how your system works. Uh, you know, by having the, the the thorough ideas and more radical ideas. So. The, the eliminating parts of the system is, is an important part of this exercise. Um, but just moving on in the interest of time, and actually I'm gonna I'm just gonna wrap up and sort of fake this this last step for you um, because it seems like some people are, are fading out here. Um, so for uh, so you've had lots of ideas in this brainstorm, and the thing is when you're brainstorming, you're not supposed to say that idea is stupid. But at some point, there, there are stupid ideas, right? Um, and so the thing is, you, you don't want to say that's stupid when you're in the brainstorm, because that kills your creativity. But after the brainstorm is done, now you can go through your ideas and say, that was stupid, that was ridiculous, that one is wrong, well, everyone will need it, that one's expensive, whatever, all these things. And so use your priorities to decide which solutions you're going to go forward with and which you're going to just drop. And so you can uh, you can use the same tools that you use to set your priorities. You can use life cycle assessment, just like they showed in the video. Um, and so you can have your existing design, and then you can, uh, it's usually best to narrow down to And then you can do an estimated life cycle assessment of those, or again, you could just do a carbon footprint, or uh, use cradle cradle certification, or whatever you want to use to measure. Um, but but keep in mind that the uncertainties here are are going to be very high. So you can't, you know, if if option B and option C look like this, you don't really know whether one is better than the other because you know in this conceptual stage. You don't really know what the energy use of manufacturing will be. You don't really know a lot of these important details. So, uh, so those are too close to, to call. You want to look for the really big improvements, like this one here. And so you just eliminate the things that are not really big, obvious improvements, um, and then choose those for your final winner. Um, and you can do complex decision matrices where you have your, your different ideas as columns, and you have your different priorities as rows, and you can assign weights to those and calculate a score for everything, um, and that's great. Uh, we're not going to do that here for the interest of time, but uh, you know you can just do your own decision-making process with the ideas that you have. Um, and so that is pretty much it, and again, like the video said, this can be an iterative process where you're going through and doing this once to define the problem and uh, set priorities, ideate new solutions, and then narrowing down to figure out what you're to decide what you're going to move forward with. Um, and you can do this again and again. Um, so are there any questions on this design method before we move on? No. OK. Um, and so it seems like a lot of uh, folks have been um, kind of fading from the workshop here. And so the, uh, the workshop was originally uh, scheduled to go until 8.30, but I just want to uh, take your pulse here and see if people are fading or if you're still raring to go and do want to do uh, like the full version of the rest of the workshop. So how many people? Um, are feeling like they're kind of fading and would like to, you know, compress the, the remaining exercise. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, okay, so that's fine. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, so the last exercise here was going to be talking about product service systems. And so this is where you're converting from selling a thing to selling a service where a thing may be part of that. 
Uh, so Zipcar is a great example of this. You know, you're not buying a car, you're buying an hour of car usage here and there. Um, and this, uh, this is a great way to reduce environmental impacts because, you know, you think about doing the mechanical engineering of a car, uh, you, you know, if you want to reduce the amount of material use, you'd be lucky, like an amazing engineer could maybe reduce the mass of a car by 20%, maybe 30%. But if you just take that one car and you share it among 10 people, then boom, you've reduced the amount of impact, the amount of mass that you've dug out of the ground and the environmental impact by 90%. Because now you only have one car for 10 people. And so that's the power of product service systems. And, oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, that's the power of product service systems. <laughs> Um, and uh, the way that this usually happens is by having more intelligence and less stuff. So uh, Zipcar, you know, back in the days before computer technology, how do you share cars? You have like a pegboard of car keys and a paper schedule, right? Like that doesn't scale. You know, that can have maybe like 10 people in a house sharing a car. That cannot have the city of San Francisco sharing cars. Um, and so what digital technology lets you do is it lets you find stuff, sort stuff, track stuff, and uh, uh, potentially automate and optimize things. So with Zipcar, uh, each car has a little bit of electronics that lets you know where that car is at all times. And when I log into the website, I can see what cars are available for what particular time. And I can sort by whatever my qualifications are, by like I want something geographically close to where I live or whatever. You can set your, uh, your priorities and you can track things. Uh, the zip car system knows when the car has been returned and if it hasn't been returned, it's not available for the next person and they know that. Um, and then, so that, that's, that's most of what you need for product service systems, is this finding and sorting and tracking. Uh, and then digital technology can also help automate things. You know, uh, autonomous vehicles are coming sometime soon. Um, and optimization, route planning, and stuff like this. So, so like Lyft or Uber, they're another form of car sharing, uh, and they engage some optimization, like if I want to split a ride with someone else, it will optimize the route to pick up both of us and drop us off at different places that, that match. Um, and product service systems are not, not just cars, but uh, one of the oldest ones is Xerox, who have been doing copy machines as services for at least 20 years, possibly 30 years, I forget, um, where you are not buying a copier, you are paying for copying services by the page. Um, and so this lines up the incentive structure. So Xerox is incentivized to not make more hardware all the time, but to keep your copier up and running smoothly so that you can get more use out of it. And so it's aligning the economic incentives with the environmental impacts. Um, and then Netflix, obviously, they uh, sort of destroyed the the brick and mortar video rental store industry uh, because they were offering the service of DVDs and now streaming, not even, not even mailed, uh, instead of a physical DVD that you went to a store to, to buy. Uh, and even carpeting is done this way. So this is a, a interface carpet uh, and you can get carpet as a service where uh, you just pay for a certain amount of years of flooring and they handle all the maintenance and all that. Um, and so how do you make product service systems succeed? It's basically these three things. Instead of it being about ownership, it's about access. Do you have access to the thing uh, and do you have it when you want it, where you want it, uh, with all the convenience? So you need to somehow improve the user experience and it's not always by convenience, Someone's, sometimes it's by quality. Uh, you know, like with Zipcar, you can get a Mercedes for an hour or two. Even if you can't afford to buy a Mercedes, you can certainly have a Mercedes for an hour. Um, and then the cost per use is another thing as well. So um, 
uh, again, with, with Zipcar, you know, you can pay 30 bucks to have a car for an evening rather than owning a car, and you'd spend more than 30 bucks just on insurance, not even paying off the car. So this is a model, uh, and this is also on the website, that VentureWell website that I showed you before, um, of different categories of product service systems. So, uh, and they're arranged by columns. So over on this side is just a normal product. It's not a product service system. It is a product that you are buying. And they're using the car as an example. So you just buy the car. Uh, and then they go to progressing levels of more and more service as you go to this end. So here is a product related service. So you're still selling the car, but then you're also selling a maintenance contract so the car lasts longer uh, and is in better shape. Um, and maybe you're selling uh, an eco driving course as well, some product related advice so that people can get the most use out of their product or use it in a more environmentally friendly way. Um, and then the most common systems for product service systems are, are in the middle. So leasing, obviously cars have been leased for decades. Uh, product sharing or renting, so that is Zipcar. You know, you're not owning the car, you're getting it by the hour. Uh, product pooling, so uh, carpools, uh, and then pay per service unit. This is also what Zipcar does, where you're just paying for one hour or five hours of car usage, um, and, and then you're done. And then next one, the uh, result-oriented. This is the next step where you don't own anything about the car, so you are just using the service. So like a taxi or Lyft or Uber, uh, someone else is handling, someone else is driving. You are not driving. You're just paying for the service. Um, and functional result is even more abstract. Like imagine if you uh, pulled up the, the Lyft app and uh, you said, I want to get from Berkeley campus to, to Oakland. And it said, great, we may send you a car. We may send you a bicycle rickshaw. We may send you a scooter. We may send you something else. Um, and so that's another level of abstraction. And then finally, pure service. Uh, in the case of cars, that doesn't really exist unless you have Star Trek transporters. Um, but you know, there are some other things that can be completely digitized, uh, you know, like newspapers going to websites and things like that. You, know, you no longer pay to have someone drop off a physical piece of paper on your doorstep. You pay for the service of being able to read the news on your own device. And there is zero extra hardware that the company uh, provides you. So, um, so let's take um, the next um, uh, few minutes, let's, let's say uh, five or 10 minutes to brainstorm how you can, let's, uh, let's pick something out of, let's make it a little more challenging. Let's, let's pick one of these and make your product into that product service system. And uh, so uh, have a couple ideas of how that could work. And for each of them, uh, think about number one, how you as a company will make money off of that. And number two, how that will improve the user experience from if you were just selling them a physical thing. OK, so go for it. And if you can have more ideas for, for it, that's great. But uh, at, least, at least two or three ideas. And for each idea, how does it make money? And how is it better for the user? OK, cool. Oh wait, I'm going to turn my microphone off.
let's uh, let's wrap up here, and that will be the last part of the of the workshop. So I'm just curious, um, what uh, what did you folks get out of? Okay, other, other things that people got out of it. How about, how about you folks, anything? Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, because again, I would say most greenwashing is unintentional. It's people who want to do the right thing, but they don't know where their priorities should be. Absolutely. And, and you had something too? Yeah, yeah, I think one interesting thing, like good and brainstorming, very nice, and we come up with crazy ideas. Uh, so it made me think of a couple of ideas that I had forgotten about, and while just talking, it came out, so that was really good. Nice. Uh, and then too, uh, I also realized while doing this, what questions I don't want to deal with personally as a per just like as an entrepreneur, but I want to outsource. And I think an interesting lesson for me, and which I think I might follow up with you, is to understand if I'm reaching out to someone to discuss these things about my business, what should be my expectations of that person now? Like I know right now if I reach out to a web designer or a designer, what are my expectations and what are my standards of uh, quality, but I don't know that with a person who is amazing in LCA and who's helping me out. You know, this thing, so, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, and LCA is a popular thing to outsource because it's complicated and, and uh, yeah, so. I have a course in LCA, but I still don't see myself doing this for my company. And I would still want someone else to just take it from me. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah, a lot of people do that, definitely. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, for me, it's the same as like. Uh, The solution of a problem then was like moving from the solution to the problem and then moving to the root cause of the problem when uh, growing all the system. And then um, once you understand the, how to prioritize uh, the root cause, then uh, and, and what's the impact of trying to apply any solution to, to that root cause, and you figure out what will be the impact. And, like, more structured way than just trying to solve something because you want to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, again, it's creating a little more structure for, for your thought. Yeah. Um, anybody anybody else have, have thoughts of what you got out of it? I think for us it was most helpful just kind of being like put out all of our ideas on a piece of paper and look at them and really see like where we can make the most impact with our project. Cool. Any other thoughts? Um, just thinking like the, like we kind of have like a structured idea of what we wanted to do, but like being able to visualize it like this, we like thought of things that we hadn't thought of before, like being able to brainstorm like just like every single component like separately, and then like you come up with ideas like, oh, I've never considered something like that before. Cool. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, and uh, anything from the, the last table over here? Nice. Cool. Um, all right. And so that is it. So please remember to do the surveys. Um, so the post workshop survey, if you want to do it electronically, is right here. Um, or I think Mimi also has paper ones. But, uh, but yeah. 
Yes, this post survey. 